Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Gavin. Thank you very much for being here. If you're new here, I dig deep into cases, like super deep into cold cases, unsolved cases, cases where justice has not been served. And this case that I'm continuing to dig into now is the case of Ellen Ray Greenberg. She was a 27 year old school teacher in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area who died on January 26th of 2011. According to statements that uh, her live-in fiance made, a man named Sam Goldberg, you can see him right here, he says he found her dead on the floor of, of the kitchen of the apartment that they shared in an upscale area of Philadelphia. Now, I think that his story is complete, utter tripe. It's nonsense. It is a complete fabrication, in my opinion, based on the evidence that I have covered in depth in other videos. I'll link to playlists down below. But that was his story. Uh, my belief is that Ellen was murdered and my number one person of interest would definitely be Sam Goldberg. So that's where I am. Anyway, I dig deep into these cases. So if you're new here, please stick with me, check out the other videos. And if you like this video, please subscribe. To you subscribers that are already here, welcome back and thank you for continuing to watch my videos. That really helps me in my personal quest to become a full-time YouTuber. And a special thank you goes out to my Patreon supporters who make it possible for me to do this month to month. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I wanna start off by talking a little bit about ethics. Um, specifically ethics for people who are public employees or who are elected officials. And I'm going to focus on the state of Pennsylvania because this is where this case is, right? Uh, and you can go to the official Pennsylvania website. You can find the State Ethics Commission and they will talk uh, about restricted activities, which are conflicts of, they don't want you to, to engage in conflicts of interest. Uh, that one's pretty straightforward. No public official or public employee shall engage in conduct that constitutes a conflict of interest. It doesn't go in to say exactly what that is, but there are tomes and tomes of legal volumes that discuss what conflicts of interest are and it's actually pretty easy for us to understand as well conflicts of interest yeah it's not that big of, it's not that big of a mystery right also the other two that i wanted to point out is seeking improper influence this basically says don't go out trying to buy politicians or public employees don't do that and then uh, letter C here is accepting improper influence. That one is to the public uh, officials and the public employees. That, is, that says don't accept anybody trying to, to pay you off. So in short, don't engage in conflicts of interest. For, for the people who aren't elected, aren't public employees, don't try to buy off politicians. And for the politicians, public employees, don't let yourself be bought. Those are the main <laughs> things, right? So in light of that, let me just show you this video. Check this out. Oh, what a sweetheart. Not a mean bone in his body. Looks can be deceiving. Just ask the dozens of public officials from both parties Josh Shapiro charged and convicted. Or the health insurance giants that tried to take advantage of patients. Oh my. Or the big drug companies that got people hooked on opioids. Still, he looks like a teddy bear. Until you poke him. Josh Shapiro, in uncertain times, a governor we can count on. Okay, so if, you, if you're not living in the state of Pennsylvania, you can probably figure out from that video that it's an ad from the current Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, a guy named Josh Shapiro, uh, who is running for governor this year in 2022. He wants the top spot in the administration of the Commonwealth, right? And he's saying in that video, hey, look at me, I am not corrupt. A bunch of other politicians that I've actually prosecuted are corrupt, but I, at least he's implying, am as pure as the wind-driven snow. That is something that I want to address today, and I'm going to get into some details here, so stick with me. Before we do, let me 
let me kind of set the scene and go over a quick timeline of events. This is 30,000 foot view, okay? <laughs> if you want more details, head on over to my website, to the Ellen Greenberg page, and you will find detailed details, including this amazing timeline right here uh, that the Greenbergs helped me put together. Okay, 30,000 foot view. Ellen died on January 26, 2011, and that on the next day after she had had an autopsy done, the medical examiner who worked on her, a guy named Dr. Marlon Osborne, uh, he, he wrote his autopsy report and he ruled Ellen's death a homicide, but he did not make it official, okay? Sometime after that, he was called into a meeting from a member of the district attorney's office, a member of the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania um, police department, and they convinced him that she couldn't have died by homicide. It was definitely a suicide because Sam Goldberg, this guy right here, told them that he broke down the door to get in, that it was locked from the outside, and that he had a witness, a guy named Philip Hanton, that witnessed him break down the door. So, subsequent to that meeting, the medical examiner, Dr. Osborne, changed the manner of death from homicide to suicide. Uh, he said she did it to herself, which is ridiculous, but okay, 30,000 foot view, I'm gonna stay focused, all right. The Greenbergs shortly thereafter, you know, kind of smelling that this wasn't quite right, they hired uh, a man as an attorney, his name is Larry Krasner, this is Mr. Krasner. Now, when they hired Mr. Krasner, he was in private practice, but um, subsequently, he was elected district attorney in uh, Philadelphia, but okay. So they hire Mr. Krasner and then they seek out the opinion of Dr. Cyril Wecht. He is a pathologist that is well known within our community of citizen detectives and web sleuths, right? He, uh, uh, and he said, nah, this one stinks of a homicide and you can look at his report on the website. Okay, so he delivered that report to the Greenbergs in January of 2012. The Greenbergs are kind of fighting with Mr. Krasner. They're not fighting with Mr. Krasner, but along with Mr. Krasner, they're fighting to get the Philadelphia, uh, you know, political machine to, to see reason that it wasn't possible that Ellen did it to herself. It wasn't physically possible. And uh, they're getting nowhere. In about 2015, right around that time, a guy named Guy, named Guy D'Andrea, he was working in the district attorney's office. He was a prosecutor. He found the Ellen Greenberg file in a box, literally stuffed into a closet, and it was covered with Christmas ornaments. And he asked permission to look into the case. He was given permission to look into the case. And uh, he started looking into it, and he started interviewing people. And he, he believed that Ellen Greenberg's death was a homicide. Whole time the Greenbergs are fighting this, they're trying to they're trying to make some type of momentum when Mr. Krasner in 2018 was elected as the attorney general, not the attorney general, I'm sorry, the district attorney in Philadelphia. So he no longer could uh, represent the Greenbergs and he then had a clear conflict of interest. He, the district attorney's office, who he had been fighting with on behalf of the Greenbergs for years now, couldn't couldn't continue to investigate the case because there was that conflict of interest. He had represented the Greenbergs. So the district attorney's office in about 2018 referred the case to the Pennsylvania State Attorney General's office and went to Mr. Shapiro's office. We just saw what Mr. Shapiro looks like. Okay, now later in 2018, the Greenbergs, um, had a lawyer named Walter Cohen, and they have a man working with them named Tom Brennan, who is an amazing, credentialed, full of bona fides, uh, former investigator with over 800 homicide investigations to his credit. They go in and they talk with representatives from the district attorney's office, uh, who were Christopher Phillips, Jennifer Silber, and Michelle Henry. And 
they were told that the attorney general's office has looked at the case and they agree with the medical examiner's office. They agree that Ellen Greenberg did it to herself. And ever since then, from time to time, when there's been a little bit of headway in the case, when the Greenbergs filed a lawsuit, for example, or when there was a deposition uh, from a doctor who said, yeah, these, these wounds happened post-mortem, things like that, the attorney general's office would make public statements, usually through a press release, or if a, if a reporter asked them, they would say, no, we've looked at this closely. We still believe that Ms. Greenberg did this to herself. So that is the 30,000 foot view of this. Okay, but now if we can zoom in just a little bit, I want to talk about what happened on the day that Ellen died. This was January 26th, 2011. Um, Sam Goldberg made a 911 call at about 6.31 p.m. You can go to my website or to my channel and you can listen to the entire 911 call. But that's not the first call that he made. Uh, he made a call first to uh, his first cousin, a man named Kamian Schwartzman. This is a picture of Mr. Schwartzman with his wife, Esther, that I found on uh, Esther's Facebook page. So he called Kamian Schwartzman, and uh, he, he made, that call happened at 6.14 p.m., and then he started making a couple of other calls and he missed a couple of calls from Kamian's dad, a man named uh, James Schwartzman. This is James. Uh, he's referred to as Uncle Jimmy in the family and you can see that he is in a robe. James is an attorney as is Kamian by the way. But James also has a position where he is a judge uh, when it comes to uh, disciplining other lawyers, right? So he missed a couple calls from Uncle Jimmy, but then Uncle Jimmy finally got a hold of him at 6.26 p.m., a full five minutes before um, Sam made the 911 call, okay? That's pretty important. Now, at about 6.36, well, no, about 6.34 p.m., I'm gonna show you some security footage here. Um, the timestamp on this security footage, by the way, is about four minutes fast, but what we're seeing here is Kamian Schwartzman arriving at the Venice Lofts Apartments, which is the apartment building where Ellen and Sam lived. So it's 634, that's when Kamian arrived, about 636 is when Kamian entered the elevator and it wasn't until about a minute later that EMTs and police started showing up. 6.36 is when the first firefighter EMTs arrived. 6.39 is when the first time police arrived. And then there was a guy that I'm referring to, Top Goat Guy, who I don't know his identity, but I believe he is a lawyer. I've tracked where he came from, um, he, and I've confirmed that he's not a tenant um, he arrived and I believe that he was Sam Goldberg's lawyer. So that is what happened uh, the day that Ellen died. I find it suspicious that Sam called Kamian Schwartzman, took a call from Jimmy Schwartzman. And uh, by the way, none of those conversations are in the official record if you go uh, over to the website and you take a look at the investigative files, uh, sorry, um, yeah, all these, all these case files, none of the investigators ever noted, at least in the files that we have, that that phone call was ever made. We also know, though we don't have video evidence of it because the city of Pennsylvania, or city of Philadelphia, will not give us any more of the footage from that night other than the couple hours that they gave us. Um, we also understand for witnesses that Sam Goldberg was taken away in handcuffs and he had an attorney present. So I personally find it extremely suspicious that Sam made those first calls and that his fixer cousin, 
fixer being some, that's what some people have described him as to me, arrived even before firefighters, EMTs, and police. So that got me to thinking, is there, is there, is there some connection? And guys, I was never able to find that connection um, until I received this email right here. I've got a screen grab of it. This came, I'm gonna show you, just so you guys know how to do this, if you go to my website and you click on the contact form, you can contact me and you can be completely anonymous. You can be as anonymous as you want. You don't have to put in your name. You don't have to put in your email, your phone number. You can just tell me what it is that you wanna tell me. And that's what this person did. This person said, hoping to submit anonymously, but I know Josh Shapiro went to a very small high school with Judge Schwartzman's daughter, Kim. His daughter's kids now go to the same school and Josh is very active as one of the most famous alums, Jake Tapper is the other. We all graduated around the same time Kim Schwartzman one year before Josh. They definitely knew each other or they definitely know each other. I am sure there are other connections from the mainline Jewish community, but for sure through Akiba, now Barack. Guys, when I got this um, tip, I was, I was so excited. I love it. I love it when I get tips. I, I love it. And I, and I don't mind at all that they come in anonymously, by the way. So, but I can't take it right at face value, right? I have to figure out um, if this person is telling the truth or is remembering it correctly. So the very first thing I did when I got that was I checked to see if Josh Shapiro went to that school. And sure enough, if you go to the Jack M. Barack Hebrew Academy website and you go to the alumni area, the very first alumni spotlight is Josh Shapiro, class of 91. That led me to eBay, where I then purchased the 1991, it used to be called Akiba Hebrew Academy, I uh, don't know if you guys can see that right there. Now it's called the Jack Barack Hebrew Academy. And sure enough, uh, there is Mr. Shapiro right there. All right. He is a senior in 1991, class of 91. Okay. Now I needed to figure out, did this person who gave me this tip... I know that Shapiro went to the school, right? But did, um, did Judge Schwartzman's daughter. And I went to the um, alumni Facebook page and there is, there she is, there's a photo that lists Kimberly Schwartzman Kimmel, class of 88. This is Ms. Kimmel, Mrs. Kimmel right there along with her son in that public photo from the class of 1988. Okay, so getting back to this tip, we know that at least they went to school together at about the same time, right? Uh, Kimberly Schwartzman Kimmel would have been a senior when Josh Shapiro was in ninth grade. That doesn't necessarily mean that they know each other. It means that they went to the same small school together, right? So. I started kind of looking at uh, other stuff and I found, actually, if you go to the, um, uh, the alumni page, I think, of the uh, Barack Hebrew Academy, there is this photo right here up at the top. And so I'm gonna just kind of give you a, um, let's see if I can find this here real quick, the alumni pic, there we go. So this is that entire photo and in this photo, you can see Mr. Shapiro and uh, Kimberly Schwartzman Kimmel. Okay, so we know at least that they have been within uh, 10 or 12 feet of one another, but does that mean that they know each other? Because if they know each other, I think that we've got a conflict of interest here because um, that might mean that when Kamian arrived that night uh, to the apartment complex, and uh, started discussing things with Sam 
even before the EMTs or police arrived, it's possible that if he knows the attorney general of the Commonwealth or that his dad knows the attorney general of the Commonwealth, that there is a conflict of interest that they know one another, right? So I wanted to see if there was any more evidence that they, that they might know each other a little bit closer. And then I uh, found this photo. Um, it turns out there's Mr. Shapiro and right to his left, that right there is Kimberly Schwartzman, Kimmel. So uh, there they are like touching elbows. And what I've learned is that they both have daughters on the same basketball team. They both have daughters on the same volleyball team. This Mr. Shapiro and Mrs. Kimmel, they run in the same circles. And getting back to my anonymous tip, the anonymous tip said, I'm sure there are other connections from the mainline Jewish community. And I had, I wondered what is the mainline Jewish community? I had to look it up. I actually asked a friend of mine, uh, and this is a good place to pause, by the way, guys, because I have made a friend who is a producer at um, 2020 at ABC News. Uh, she happens to be of Hebrew heritage as well. And so when I have questions about Judaism, <laughs> uh, I ask her, she, she tells me all about it. And I said, what is the mainline uh, Jewish community. Oh, but before I move on from this, uh, I made, when I started telling her about these connections, she became very, very interested. And so I just want to pause here for a second, guys. Not only am I interested, but um, a producer that I'm working with at 2020 is also very interested. So if you happen to know anything about the connections between the Schwartzman family and uh, Attorney General Shapiro, please reach out to me on my website. Go to my website right here. Go to contact me right up here. And, um, and you can be completely anonymous. And I'm going to share that with my friend at 2020. Anyway, when I talked to her, her words to me were, rich white Jews, mainline Jewish community. So when we look at it, the main line in Philadelphia is the area of Philadelphia that is an historic area. It's extremely wealthy and a Hebrew, Hebrew Academy is right there in the main line. So uh, people who are of Hebrew descent, they send their children if they can afford it to now what's called Barak Hebrew Academy. And, um, so, so that, that sentence, they have other connections, right? So we know that they're connected through the school. And one of my suspicions is, you know, is it possible that they're trading favors by maybe giving donations? Uh, could the Schwartzmans or the Goldbergs or the extended family be donors to Mr. Shapiro. I wanna show a quick little uh, kind of rough sketch of the, uh, the family. Um, down here in the lower right where the three squares are, you, that's where you can see Sam Goldberg in the middle. Uh, when you go up, his parents are Richard Goldberg and Mindy Hankin and then Mr. Schwartzman is married to Mindy's sister, Nancy, and then came in and Kimberly are, are their children. Now, the thing that I want you to remember here though, is the name Hankin is a very longstanding wealthy member of this mainline Jewish community. Uh, they have apartment buildings, they have uh, commercial uh, real estate holdings. They, they have, they, they have so much money guys that, um, that they have the ability to influence politicians in a way that is restricted, uh, over here on the state ethics commission, uh, section 1103, uh, B and C, right. They are, they're not supposed to do that, of course, but they probably have the ability to do that. And so I did a little bit of looking into to see if there are donations. And um, 
Yeah, I found donations. Uh, if I if we go to followthemoney.org, we can see that this is Kimberly Schwartzman Kimmel has donated to her one and only candidate is Josh Shapiro. Her husband Wayne has uh, donated to a lot of uh, candidates over the years. Uh, Mr. Shapiro's at the top of that list. If we go back to uh, the Goldberg family, this person, Richard Goldberg right here, uh, that's Sam Goldberg's dad. Uh, he has donated to Mr. Shapiro, uh, though it, it's a small donation, but it's definitely a donation. Uh, he has done it twice. Once was in a house uh, race and once was in the, um, I think actually they were both in house races. And then here the Hankin group, um, they have, let's see, I had to, I had to really look through here guys. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Shapiro is right there as a recipient of money from the Hankin group. Now, you guys are going to probably be asking, maybe you're saying it really wasn't that much money that you added up there, Gavin. Was it less than $10,000? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, it's just about $10,000 that I found um, in my original cursory search. But it's not all that I found. So I guess what I'm saying here is that Josh Shapiro, let me, uh, let me, well, I was going to show you the ad again, but you guys have seen it. Josh Shapiro, who claims that uh, he is above reproach. Oh, wait a minute. Before, before I do that, let me go back over here to um, Kamian and Esther. Take a look at Kamian and Esther. And uh, now let me show you. This picture, this is the ninth grade class when um, Josh Shapiro was at Akiba. Let me just zoom up right here. This young woman right here, that is Esther Schwartzman. So not only do we have connections through the Schwartzman family, but we have connections through uh, Esther's family. Uh, her name was... Um, Let's see, I think it was Esther Alexander. Is that what it was? The Alexander family? Let me take a look at that. Uh, where is that? Let me go back over here so you guys can see what I'm looking at. The middle row. Yeah, Esther Alexander. And that is, that's her right there. So there are connections to this family. Now, is it possible that Josh Shapiro is not aware that Kimberly Schwartzman, who he <laughs> is seen shoulder to shoulder with in this photo. Is it possible that he doesn't know that Kimberly is related to Kamian and that Kamian uh, was the person that Sam Goldberg called and arrived before police and that uh, James Schwartzman uh, talks with Sam Goldberg before Sam Goldberg ever called 911. Is it possible that Josh Shapiro doesn't know this or hasn't made the connection? I mean, I guess it's possible, but I think it is not likely. It's highly improbable. And the fact that he's accepted money from these people, from the Schwartzmans, from the Hankins, from the Goldbergs, to me, that screams, guys, it screams conflict of interest. This right here, where uh, no public official or public employee shall engage in conduct that constitutes a conflict of interest. And I, I'm certain that this is a conflict of interest for Mr. Shapiro. What I suspect is that he is probably in violation of sections B and C of the statute as well. So I guess my question to you is, what do you think? And what can be done about this? Now, um, you guys are probably like, well, he's running for governor. This is a hit piece on Mr. Shapiro. Guys, I... I will give you a sneak peek into the politics of Gavin Fish. I keep politics out of my, my channel for very good reasons, 
but I'm just gonna give you a sneak peek into the politics of Gavin Fish. I am neither a Democrat nor a Republican. I am neither planning on voting for Mr. Shapiro or the Republican that's running against him, Mr. Mastriano. I have no dog in that hunt. I'm not gonna vote for either one of those people, those candidates. You guys vote for whoever you think you should vote for if you're in the state of Pennsylvania. This is not a hit piece on Josh Shapiro. My point in all of this is that Mr. Shapiro's office should not have this file at all, and I believe that they know it. This file, this investigation, should be passed on to another investigative uh, office. And it can't be any office that is below the attorney general's office. It needs to be some kind of special prosecutor who is not beholden to Mr. Shapiro. And if Mr. Shapiro wins the election and becomes governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that's going to be extremely difficult, right? Within the state of Pennsylvania, he's, he would, he's one step above the chief law enforcement officer. Like right now, he's the chief law enforcement officer of the state. If he's the governor, then yeah, it has to go to a special prosecutor that might be on a federal level or something because there is a clear conflict of interest. There is a clear appearance of the impropriety of accepting money and giving favors. I'm not saying that it happened. I'm saying the appearance is there and that is enough. Mr. Shapiro's entire office should get rid of this, not get rid of the case. It should hand it off to another investigating agency because of that conflict of interest. I would love to know what you guys think. Please put it in the comments section below. And uh, my next video, at least on the Ellen Greenberg case, is going to get into the brief that was filed by Mr. Podraza on behalf of the estate of Ellen Greenberg. Um, I'm, I'll give you a sneak peek into this one, guys. I believe after speaking with Mr. Podraza that the uh, strategy that the state of Pennsylvania is, well, the city of Philadelphia is employing here is one of delaying uh, just by appealing this, um, this decision that was made by the trial judge. Um, they've probably delayed the trial by about two years. And my guess is that if they lose their appeal, they'll probably appeal to the state Supreme Court. So um, the state of, Pen of Pitt, Philadelphia is acting so unethically in this whole thing. And I'm going to get into the brief that, um, that Mr. Pedraza filed on behalf of Ellen's parents. That's my next video on Ellen Greenberg. My next video on uh, the case of David Scott Elmquist is also coming up. In that one, I will be going over the day of, um, of Mr. Elmquist's death. So uh, please subscribe if you wanna see those videos. If you like this kind of content, please hit that thumbs up and share, 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 guys. This, this information should just get all the way around the state of Pennsylvania. People should know this, that Mr. Shapiro has a clear conflict of interest. With that, I shall bid you adieu, and I hope to see you next time. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.